Well, once again, we talk about it all the time in Kansas City and hopefully can educate some of the Cardinal fans about the Negro Leagues, whether it be uh, what happened here in St. Louis or nationwide. And let's continue that conversation. And there's, by the way, the website and number to call to find out more information about the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. So just a short drive away for Cardinal fans. But I want to ask you about Cool Papa Bell, uh -huh. you know, with the St. Louis connection. Um, what can you tell our fans about Cool Papa? Our understanding of Cool Papa Bell, James Thomas Bell from Starksville, Mississippi, uh, was a star in the Negro League, started as a pitcher. Right. Uh, and that's really how he got his nickname, because he was able to pitch uh, to top hitters uh, and be cool in the clutch, they used <laughs> to say. Uh, but obviously, his speed and his athleticism won out over pitching, and he was able to play the outfield, one of the fastest men to play baseball. And there's all these great stories. Of course, you know, the legendary story from Satchel Paige that he was so fast that he could get in the bed. Uh, turn out the light, get in the bed before the room got dark. Right. Uh, that he could score uh, from first on a bunt <laughs> and all kinds of great uh, uh, stories like that. But more importantly, he became someone who was a mentor to a lot of players. He coached in the Negro Leagues as well after his playing days with the Monarchs. It was one of the people who recommended Ernie Banks to the Monarchs and ultimately Buck O'Neill who uh, eventually passed on to Chicago Cubs and got Ernie Banks to Major League Baseball and of course was a mentor to the great Lou Brock you as well. You bet. Signed him, brought him to Chicago and that's right off the mask of our home plate umpire Phil Cuzzy. My understanding was that once Cool Papa settled in to St. Louis after his playing career and he was going to be inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame they, they couldn't find him and then they finally tracked him down and he was working as a janitor at City Hall. Mm. Is that is that true. Yeah that's my understanding and it's, it's not uncommon for a lot of the ball players uh, during that period. They many of them had kind of faded into obscurity even someone as uh, prolific in his day as 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 cool Papa Bell. Uh, guys had to had to make a living. They didn't have a pension from Major League right. Baseball so they did the best they could. And occasionally they could make money signing autographs, but uh, these are players. And even Bell was a bit of a star, but he wasn't a satchel page. Sure. In that that he had the longevity and the charisma and things uh, to have a long career in that way. How many of the Negro leaguers are still with us? We estimate really under 150 uh, who played in the heyday, and then there are lots of guys who played African-American baseball not necessarily connected to the prime Negro Leagues and there are a few more of them around. Uh, we've lost a lot of the guys uh, from um, that core period that uh, when Page and Bell uh, really competed. But there are lots of great stories in the Negro Leagues, maybe even some obscure stories. I like to especially being a St. Louis and and the bun is down there by Daniel Ponce de Leon out at second back to first and not in time. Let's hear it. Just you know there's some names out there that maybe folks don't know I, re I recall interviewing a, a man named Ross Davis who was also from Mississippi uh, who played semi pro ball first here in St. Louis talked about playing in Tandy Park uh, with, with with players before he got a chance to go to the Negro Leagues. Maybe fo folks may have heard of the Alex Smith who was a knuckleballer from St. Louis yep. who played in Mexico and in the Negro Leagues. Uh, folks may have heard of Sam Jethro. Uh, I know you're probably too young to remember Sam Jethro, but he no, was from no, East no. St. Louis yeah. and uh, oh, yeah. was rookie of the year with the Braves teaming up with Henry Aaron. And, and some folks may remember Elston Howard, Vashon High School, multi-sport athlete um, who could have played uh, Big Ten college sports, but signed with the Negro Leagues, uh, with the Monarchs, and then ultimately became the first African-American to play for the New York Yankees, ultimately replacing another St. Louis in, uh, in Yogi Berra. Ties in, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very interesting history. We encourage folks to come to the museum to learn about those players, uh, the great innovations that they made in the Negro Leagues, and it's it's a very broad story, and it, and it really covers the history of America um, in a time that was you know not great for African Americans, but uh, what paved the way for players like Lou Brock and, and Bob Gibson uh, and Orlando Cepeda 
and and, and, it's, and it's important that the, the Latin players are also very important. Yes. I want to challenge you on something. Uh, next time you and McCarver in San Francisco, <laughs> seems like McCarver always gets the best gigs with the best food. Oh, he's he got, he, we, <laughs> you're perceptive. <laughs> but when you go to San Francisco, get Orlando Cepeda because there's yep. somebody who knows. I mean, it's great to hear those stories about the '60s and the Cardinals, but ask him about his dad. His dad played in Puerto Rico with Josh Gibson and yes. those players. He knows as much about the Negro Leagues as anybody and is just knowledgeable. We actually talked about it one time. Good. good. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And I think these nights are so important and to have you here in the booth it's so important. This is Carpenter two and two the count because if you went to a young kid and you said hey did you understand that that black ball players were not allowed to play in Major League Baseball. They, what? Yeah. Are you crazy? <laughs> but, and it's really not that long ago. So it's important that these young people understand not just about baseball, but what was going on in the history of our country, as you mentioned. Absolutely. And of course, these these issues of race and things, uh, of course, they still rear their ugly head today. Yeah. But we hope that sport and baseball can be an entree uh, to teaching the young people about uh, a, a safe way to on-ramp into talking about discussions of race uh, in our society. And we think that at the museum, we, we strive very hard to do that. And that pitch taken inside by Matt Carpenter. At nights like this with African American Heritage Night uh, and what the Royals do with us uh, to have the Negro Leagues tributes uh, is important. And the young people can see today's stars uh, talk about this history. I'm reminded of um, Especially the Royals hosting Negro League nights and 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 they wear the uniforms and the Royals usually play pretty good except for that one game they had a few years ago when Albert Pujols was the Cardinals were in town. I remember. <laughs> Took them deep. But that, what I remember about that day was uh, we had the Negro League players there, uh, Buck O'Neill and Ted Double D Ratcliffe and Mike Shannon made a point to bring Albert over to talk to them. That's tremendous. And uh, um, and that was the first time I met Albert and I haven't met him since because he has ties to Kansas City and he comes to the museum and so many of the other young players come there uh, as well. And so the young fans see that as well and they know these guys have been to the museum and so they, it piques their interest as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So two runners on want to know the count here on Paul DeYoung and there's a strike. There's also the the Buck O'Neill legacy seat which is there for every game. So. You may not be wearing the uniforms. It may not be a heritage night, but yet that seat is there to remind everybody what it's all about. Yes, and and Buck was such a presence at the oh, stadium. Man. Um, people loved him, and he always loved to tell stories. And and, and he was never one to to tell a lot of folklore because he would say he would say you don't need to believe the lie because the truth is better. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but he was such a great ambassador for the museum, such a person who uh, was really it bitter. No, not at not, all. Not at all. I, I just I, that floored me every time I talked to him. How positive and upbeat and excited he was to talk about it, and never in a negative kind of uh, way. He was just so positive. Indeed. There's the catch made in right field, and Daniel Ponce de Leon tagging up from second to third. How do you sustain it? Uh, is it through donations? Is it through bodies coming through the turnstiles there? How do you do it? All of it. So we have a membership program that folks uh, all across the country can join. Uh, you can just make a donation to the museum through the website. Uh, we sell merchandise and memorabilia, and we have a licensing program. Uh, if you see Negro League uh, marks and logos on shirts and caps and things, more than likely we own them and folks can go and uh, buy that material of course from our shop but also all around the country we have licensees as far away as Japan and in Europe as well. Are you concerned about African Americans playing the game now and the lack of participation. Well I I'm one of those who uh, I would love to see more African Americans play baseball. Uh, my hope is that the young people are not being denied an opportunity to play the game and I think Major League Baseball is addressing that. I will tell you though when the young man Kyler Murray was uh, thinking Football about and, yeah. making a switch I was a little upset with baseball I said why don't you recruit him you know to play baseball just like he's being recruited for college sure he's not only is a fine athlete but he seemed like a fine young man we need more people like that regardless of color but especially because of who he was and his background uh, we should have put the full court press on, on, on players like that do you think there needs to be more attention to the Negro Leagues now we have 
Jackie Robinson Day, and he played in the Negro Leagues and broke the color barrier in the game. But does there need to be, as we move forward and, and past the Negro Leagues and those players, do we need to have more attention towards it in Major League Baseball to, to shine a light on it? Well, I want to commend Major League Baseball because they've been a big supporter of ours uh, for a number of years. We do always do something with the All-Star Game. We have a large exhibit uh, at the All-Star Game Fan Fest, and they've even gotten more exhibits uh, through uh, other partners to have in the All-Star Game City. So when you, if you go to Cleveland this summer, you'll see our presence there as well. So I think they're being very supportive. Uh, but uh, I, I welcome more attention as yeah. much as possible. And it's important for folks to understand the shoulders upon whom Jackie Robinson and the other players uh, stand. Do you hear from modern players? Now, I know when, when the Cardinals go through, um, and we'll have players from Puerto Rico and mm -hmm. Mexico, uh, black players, white players, they all want to go to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Are you finding that these players, the modern player, understands what those gentlemen did and and have a true appreciation of it. I think they do um, and perhaps maybe when they first get there they don't uh, but after a while they see it and they understand they see themselves in those young men in those photographs and okay. they enjoy it. Wonderful to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's an honor. God bless you man. Thank you. It's awesome.